I've um, been working in cloud computing for, for quite a while and actually have written quite a few books. My, my blog, Cloud Musings, is uh, followed by many people around the world, about uh, 20,000 views a month. Uh, my latest book, Architect and Cloud Computing, was actually on the bestsellers list for cloud computing on Amazon. I also have professional certifications in this as an architect, uh, both for solutions in the federal government um, and on Amazon. And as you can imagine, I've, I've done a few courses for Pluralsight. Uh, the reason I say this before I start off is because I'm not speaking from an academic point of view. Um, we're talking here about how to protect your data in an operational sense. If you are in, in the uh, public sector or if you are in business, this is a very important operational aspect of your work. So I'm speaking from experience, uh, from interacting with many individuals across multiple industries as they have undergone this this um, transition or this journey uh, to cloud computing. So what's important to know, however, is how do we actually get here? Why has cloud computing become so much a part of, of our lives, of our professional lives? Well, way, 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 way back um, in the Stone Age, or the computing stone age that is in the in the 70s, uh, the focus was on big infrastructure. You remember the saying, if you buy IBM, you'll never go wrong because business was run and driven by the IBM mainframe. In fact, you connected with that mainframe through terminals. And it was a big transformation when these green screen terminals became personal computers. The networks became decentralized and relational databases were developed to make business processes more standardized. You could, if you understood what type of data and information you needed to do your business or do your mission, you were able to develop tables and link those tables in a manner that would replicate your business or mission process. This relational database was connected to a front-end application or a thick client terminal. That made the back-end data very tightly coupled to the front-end application. Um, and do you remember the time where your computer was underneath your desk yeah, I remember those days. Well, maybe I um, you know, shouldn't be giving off my age, but you actually had a piece of hardware underneath your desk. And if you needed to install an application, uh, a live person would actually come to your desk and they would have to confirm that you had the right CPU and the right amount of storage that would even run the application and the tech would install an application on your computer and all your information was right there. If that computer failed, you would lose everything. In fact, that was a big problem. So as we moved forward, the internet became a thing and devices became smaller, easy to use, very visually attractive, and businesses saw this as a way to improve their processes, improve their business flow. They saw the wide area network as a way to get this data on desk. Initially, it was just a local area network where you connected to the cubicle next to you or you connected to the main building server on the next floor, and then you connect to the next building that was next door or across the street in the next state. Eventually, you use the wide area network to connect everyone to the same backend server. 
But as these connections became longer and longer, it took more time for data to get from the back end to the front end application. This network latency became a problem because the applications themselves, these thick client applications were designed to operate you know, on a desktop with the computer right there. So the applications began to time out and business leaders started to complain to the software developers and say, what's wrong with this application? It doesn't work. Well, that was a, that was a big problem. And in conjunction with these issues, there was an increase in the amount of data that was being used. And people started leaving their desk in droves and they became mobile. In fact, our whole society became mobile with wireless mobility. And Google revolutionized search by leveraging a, a new way of having data in the back end. They went from this relational database model where you had a database schema and structured tables to unstructured data, so-called NoSQL or no structured query language backend databases. The other thing that happened was the software developers said, well, you know, we need to release or relax the connection between the front end applications and the back end database these old legacy applications had the state of the application in the backend server. When I say state, state, it's like if you're going through a process, you would do step one, then step two, then step three, and so forth. The step number was the state. So when you had the state in the back end, when you connect it from the front end, you had to stay with the same server because that server kept track of your state. When you have a timeout, for instance, you would be on like state 467 and you would have, you would connect to the back end and the back end server would say, I'm sorry, who are you? And you would have to start at step one all over again. You can imagine how many, uh, complaints that drove. So the software developers changed that by taking the state of the application from the back end and put it in the front end. This enabled the application in the front end, which is now on a browser, to tell the back end what state they were at. This also sort of freed the application from having to connect to the same server every time. This enabled virtualization to improve the efficiency and the utilization of the back end. Because now you didn't have to be connected to a physical server, you could use these virtual or software based servers. So the widespread use of browsers, also known as thin clients, the use of virtualization that improved the resource utilization and a transition from structured data led to cloud computing being born as an operational model. So today, we use cloud computing with loosely coupled applications. We have these back end infrastructures that are elastic and scalable. They can grow and shrink based upon user demand. This enables agile business. So every organization wants to be agile. So they're all jumping on the bandwagon now to adopt cloud services. So your data is no longer 
under your desk. It's no longer in your data center that you own. It's running on somebody else's infrastructure, the cloud service provider. That means you can't depend on that infrastructure because it's not yours. You can't hug it. You, you don't even know where it is sometimes. So now security has left the infrastructure. You have to really transition from this infrastructure centric data model or data protection model, this infrastructure centric security model to a data centric security model. And this in this new model, you really need to have security coupled with the data, no matter where it goes, no matter whose infrastructure it's running on. So why do we use cloud computing? We already talked about the fact that it's more agile, it can be more efficient. It also can reduce IT complexity. Hey, it's great because you don't have to do it anymore. Somebody else is doing it. Um, and you have consumption-based pricing. Since you didn't build and you're not running the infrastructure, you, can, you only need to pay for what you use. And when you're not using it, you don't have to pay for it. That has to save money somewhere. The agility is what we talked about before. You can do move things faster, you can do it better, you can do it quicker. And the other thing is that your business model itself is not limited by the infrastructure that you own. It's not limited by the infrastructure you can afford. You can run your business process on anyone's infrastructure at any time. So instead of having serial processes that are limited by the infrastructure that you own, you can go into parallel process. Service customers. This parallel process improves your scope. But there has to be some downside to this. Um, and there are. If somebody else is using your infrastructure, you may feel like you no longer have control. If you have no control, how can you protect your data? Okay, and this change, this so-called transition from infrastructure-centric to data-centric security model, is this something new? How do I do that? This changes the culture in the organization. And, you know, um, I've known people, I'm sure you know people also, and people just don't like change, especially when it comes to security. So this is a cultural change within an organization. And changing from that, you know, tightly coupled back end that use SOAP APIs to a loosely coupled application that uses REST APIs, well, I'm sorry, this is this changes how you develop applications. This changes the whole process of applications and applications replicate, they represent your business processes. So it changes your whole business, okay? So with this all in mind, now what is this, this cloud computing thing? Well, when the US government first started with cloud computing, that was a question that, that then Chief Information Officer Vivek Kundra asked. He said, well, how we need to put contracts in place for cloud computing. And the lawyer said, well, what is cloud computing? The, uh, Vivek said, well, don't you know? And they said, well, no, I looked it up in the computer and there was nothing there. And I asked my friends and every everyone had a different idea of what cloud computing was. It's probably the same today. So being the US federal government, they spent money 
to define, determine what cloud computing was. And the organization or agency responsible for that was the National Institute of Standards and Technologies in the Commerce Department. So after a few months, yeah, a few months, uh, you know, it was almost, uh, almost a year, they came up with a definition of cloud computing. Since then, this has been the most adopted definition globally outside of the United States. And you say, well, it's just a few words. Why did it have to spend so much money and so much time? Well, let's, let's look at this definition uh, for a minute and see what it says. First, it says, uh, first it says that uh, cloud computing is a model, okay? That's pretty interesting because we're talking about information technology and it didn't say that it is a technology. So cloud computing is not a technology. It's specifically not a technology. It's a way of doing things, okay? There are cloud computing um, operations models. There are cloud computing economic models. There are cloud computing business models, um, but it's not, technology. You just can't go to the Best Buy and, and buy a cloud computer and install it in your company and say it's done. All right. So it's not a technology that you can buy. It is really a model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access. Okay, I'm going to stop there because this says that it is a service that's convenient over the network. Now, that network could be the big internet, but it doesn't have to be. The, this part of the definition is driven by the targeted customer set. So you have to understand the marketplace that you're trying to service. And whatever you design, whatever model you put in place, it has to be convenient to all of your customers whenever they want or need that service. Okay. Next, it says it's a shared pool of configura configurable computing resources, be it network, server, storage, applications, and so forth. So it's shared. That means that you're not the only user. You're sharing it with other users. Now, when people first think about going to the cloud, that's one of the biggest problems. They say, I don't want to share with anybody. What about, where's security in that? Well, the shared pool drives cloud economics. That's how you save money in cloud computing is because when you're not using it, you don't have to pay for it. If you don't have, a res if you don't have resource sharing, you can't save money. And these resources, these computing resources, can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. Okay, this implies a high degree of automation. And automation requires standardization. This is why cloud computing is often referred to as a commodity. It's a commodity. It's not a bespoke solution. So when you're using, deploying, or designing around cloud computing, whatever you do has to be standardized and highly automated. These are all very important aspects of cloud. Okay. <clears throat> the key drivers for cloud, as you may already know, is the scalability and, and the ability to grow and shrink based upon the user or customer demand, the use of virtualization that um, improves utilization, reduction in cost, the ability to access your information and data from multiple devices, and you're actually independent of the device. It allows you to collaborate. And all of this is supposed to reduce your risk in accomplishing your business or your mission. The drive 
to shift from capital expenditure where you have to buy your IT to operational expenditure where you only pay for what you use is what executives want, all right? So that drives a key characteristic of cloud computing. This is this on-demand service where you can get resources provisioned whenever and wherever they're required across this broad area network. So you can access it when you need it from any location. The resource pooling reduces the cost. So you get the same capability at reduced cost. And But if you need more capability, it can expand. Clearly, it'll cost you more. But when you don't need that capability, it will retract. So your costs will go down as well. And in the end, this is driven by measured service. That means the cloud service provider knows exactly what you're using and they give you a bill. So you can test that bill, you can check that bill. It's sort of like the cottage industry around hospital care. I don't know if you ever have recently been in a hospital, but you have to look at your bill and make sure everything they charge you for is something that you used during your stay. The same thing with cloud computing. It's important to review your bill every month and make sure what you're being billed for is something that you actually used. So these are the five key cloud computing characteristics. If your service doesn't meet all of these characteristics, then it's not true cloud computing. It's not, it doesn't mean it's something you shouldn't use. It's just that it's not cloud computing. It could be a managed service, for instance, which is not cloud, it's different. So when you consume cloud, there are three service models that, these are baseline service models that you consume. Infrastructure as a service, which is basically the hardware, the data center, the facilities that hold the infrastructure, the physical aspects of IT, your platform as a service. This is a application development environment. So developers would consume a platform as a service to write an application. So you could consume a platform to deliver a software as a service which is the third service model for cloud computing. This is the presentation layer, the APIs, or application programming interfaces, and this is where your data lives um, in the cloud stack, okay? This is where you have standardization, compatibility, and global accessibility. Every other as a service that you may hear in the market or in a commercial. They're either a subset of these three or an aggregation of these three. So to keep it simple, we always say refer to these basic three. Sometimes it's called the SPY model, software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. Or you can also consume cloud in, in multiple ways. You could actually build your own cloud. This is a so-called private cloud deployment model where you have very tight control over the data. Uh, you have ownership and retention of all governance. But remember, with this control, it comes at a cost because you're going to pay for this private cloud whether you're using it or not, which means that you can't save money with the private cloud. In fact, a private cloud could cost you more than a traditional data center. All right, so that, but that is one deployment model. Uh, the second model is a public cloud. And this is when you buy or consume infrastructure as a service 
uh, or any cloud service from a public provider like Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure, um, you know, or Digital Ocean. All right. So this this is a cloud that's owned by an organization that's selling cloud services to either the general public or a specific industry group. So that's a public cloud model. But since you are that's in a shared environment, you save money. So a public deployment model saves money as opposed to a private cloud deployment model, which doesn't. Uh, the third model is a community model. This is a lot like what the, the US federal government did with the um, government community cloud. Now in a community cloud, all of the participants have a consistent governance model. This means they all use the cloud in the same way. They all have the requirement of the same type of controls, security controls on their data. This will become more important as we move forward, all right? Because they all need to protect their data in the same way. Uh, the final deployment model is a hybrid deployment model, which is composed of two or more of the other. You know, if you have a private cloud service and a public cloud service, then you have a hybrid cloud service. All right. Very cost effective to fulfill some non differentiating business functions because you can put, you know, what makes you unique in your private cloud, you know, like the, um, <clears throat> the ingredients of Kentucky Fried Chicken, this special herbs and spices, you'd put that data in your private cloud where you have control over it. But your website where you want to sell Kentucky Fried Chicken, well, you'll put that in the public cloud because you want everybody to be able to buy Kentucky Fried Chicken. Not that I'm pushing Kentucky Fried Chicken. I just had some last night for dinner. But you can see the difference. You can have a hybrid where some stuff is in the private and some stuff is in the public. So those are the four deployment models of cloud computing. Now, the purpose of this webinar is about protecting your data in the cloud. So the subject is the data. And it's very important to think about how does your data live in the cloud? This is referred to as the data life cycle. So <clears throat> first thing happens is data is created. It's created somewhere by someone. So you have this new digital content. This is when you need to classify your data once it's created. Because if you don't classify it, you don't know how to handle it, right? You don't know what security is needed on the data unless you first determine how important that data is. So if you don't understand the security controls that need for that data, then you don't know how to protect it. So if it's classified incorrectly, you lose control of your data at its point of creation. Now, after data is created, you, you, you next may want to store it. Now, why, why is this important? Why is this important? It's because you can, there may be laws, regulations, or contractual obligations that dictate where you can store data. This is part of the classification. But you, you need, it, it, it occurs nearly simultaneously with creation because you got to store it somewhere, you know, once you create the data. So once again, you need to make decisions on where to store the data or how to store the data based upon the classification of the data. Uh, third, now you're going to use it. You wouldn't have created the data unless it was useful in some way. 
So this is where data is viewed, processed, or used. And this is the most, most vulnerable phase because you have to, you may need to share the data, which is actually the next phase. Typically the data, however, if you need to process it, has to be unencrypted. So if it's unencrypted, anyone can look at it, especially if next you do is share the data. This makes the data accessible to others. Hopefully you trust that other individual or other entity that you're sharing your data with, but it can be difficult. There are people out there trying to steal your data. So this is a very, this is a very important phase of the life cycle. Finally, after data has outlived its usefulness, you're finished using it, the data leaves active use. You may still need to keep it. There may be legal reasons, regulatory reasons, or business reasons why you want to hold on to data after it's outlived its usefulness. All right. Now you have to look at how much does it cost, where to store this data, not only where, but how, how much data, all right? So, and how long will it take for me to get that data out of storage if I have it archived? So there's a cost versus availability issue. Then once you're really, really finished with that data, you'll have to destroy it. So how can you destroy data if it's not in your data center? If data is sitting in a cloud service provider, okay, you could call up on the phone and say, destroy all my data, but, but how do you know that it was actually destroyed? How do you know that the data, that the cloud service provider didn't take your data and sell it to somebody else, all right? So the only way to really destroy your data is by logical erasure of the data. And we're gonna talk more about that in, uh, later in the presentation. Since you don't know where the data is, you don't have access to the data center, you can't physically destroy like the, the disk, all right? You can't, so you have to destroy it by some digital means. So this is the data life cycle. And if you want to protect your data, you need to protect it through every phase of the digital life cycle. So you have to manage data through data governance. Your organization needs to put rules and regulations in place to make sure that the data is properly protected. So we've already alluded to the fact that you need to classify your data. So this is very valuable. And classification is more than just um, if it's sensitive or not, it's much more. You need to have policies in place so everyone in your organization knows how to classify and manage your data. This location aspect, different, different countries, different states, have different laws with respect to protecting data. You've all heard of the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe, but did you California has very similar laws when it comes to protecting data. You need to authorization who is allowed to access the data, all right? Who can take data out of the cloud? What about how does classification affect the authorization? And who is responsible for managing the information of, on, that's on the cloud? How does all this work together in your organization? This is your data governance. So when you go to the cloud, the first thing you have to review are your processes for governing that data. Now, and I said before that data classification is more than just the sensitivity. You need to think about the types of data that can go into the cloud, the jurisdiction, what laws, are there any legal constraints to the data? 
who actually owns the data. You know, you may not own, you don't own, you may not own personal data of an individual. It depends upon where you are. If that individual is a European Union citizen, they always own their data. What about contractual or business constraints? Source, where the data came from? How can you trust the source of the data? Oh, here's that value, sensitivity, and criticality of data, all right? And what is your obligation? What laws are applicable to the preservation of that data, all right? Most organizations only classify their data based upon the sensitivity. That's one of seven important aspects, or important domains for classifying your data, especially when you're going into the cloud. You also need to think about metadata. This is data about the data. For instance, my cell phone uh, may report where I am using GPS. So the data may be location, but metadata can be well, what device was reporting that location? How accurate is that location? How many GPS satellites were being used when that location was reported? What cell towers were around when that location was reported? All of that is metadata. So for every bit of data that you collect, there could be 10 bits of metadata. And as data goes through its life cycle, it may need reclassification. Sensitive data may become non-sensitive or unsensitive data may become more sensitive. And then data can be choices that you place on the data. So this may drive reclassification of the data as well. Remember, all of this is part of data governance. So as your data is created and it lives through its cycle, you need to determine, based upon its classification, what security controls need to be put in place to protect this data. All right, so because a control acts as a mechanism to restrict who can access the data. And you need to control the processes, the actors, and the location to where that data can actually go. Some examples include policies, warning banners, um, or you know, supervision, keystroke logging, all these things can control your data. So controlling this can be driven by the functions associated with the data who can access the data, what business process is being used, and how and where you can store this data. You also need to think about who can access that data. How do you identify the people, not just people, but things, a, a business process, a server that can access the data? What, how do you prove that that person is who they say they are and what authorizations do you have in place? So these actors can be internal actors or external actors. They can be entities that you know. They can be entities that you don't know that are trying to access your data. So the rules you put in place can be based upon the role that you've placed on that user, or it can be based upon a rule like where the data is. If the data is in a certain country, only people from that country can access the data, for instance. So all of this goes into your data governance. Now your data governance has to be bounced up against the type of service that you're consuming. If it's infrastructure as a service, you could store data on the actual virtual machine. This is called ephemeral storage or you can put it in what's called object storage. This is data in large files. Another one is raw storage. 
This is a bitwise mapping of data and archiving or long-term storage. These are all different ways of storing data and infrastructure. If you're consuming platform as a service, you have data in relational databases, you can have it in key value storage, or you could have it in a non-relational database uh, like MapReduce, right? Hadoop or Mongo databases. And in software, you can store data um, in the actual uh, application, or you can store data across what's known as a content delivery network. This is where data is distributed to multiple geographically distributed nodes. So these are all ways of storing your data. And if you want to make sure you can get your data, you may replicate your data to different locations. So that could be a strict consistency where you make sure all copies are the same or eventual consistency, which is what's used mostly in the cloud. So all of these go into, along with data location, go into your governance process for your data. And don't forget, if the data is useful, you want to be able to find your data. So the goal is not only to store and protect your data, but to be able to find your data and use it. This is all driven by classification. Things like big data analytics or real-time analytics and, and agile business intelligence. All of these things are driven by classification. This metadata, labeling your data, or actually content analysis are critical in being able to find and use your data. So poor data quality drives cost, data location, data access, all of these things a part of your data governance. So when you're protecting your data against things like unauthorized usage or liability, denial of service, data leakage, breach, theft, all of these aspects of protecting your data, it's driven by your data governance. Earlier I said you no longer have the infrastructure, so you have to take protection with your data. One of the easiest ways of doing that is encryption, where you have to encrypt your data in motion, you encrypt it at rest, or you encrypt it while it's in use. All of these things are critical in the cloud. So you have the data, you have to have the encryption engine, and you have to have keys, and you have to manage those keys, who has access to the keys, where the keys live. And in an infrastructure as a service, you have different type of encryption possibilities. You can have basic storage level encryption or volume encryption or object storage encryption. In platform as a service, you have file encryption and transparent encryption, which is specific to databases. And in the software, you have application level encryption. Remember, all of this has to be in your data governance. And if you're going to encrypt, where do you manage your keys? Who has access to the keys? Who, where do you store your keys? How do you back up and replicate your keys? Do you manage your keys internally or externally? Or do you use a third party? All of these things are in your data governance. And based upon Based upon the classification of the data, you may need to mask the data. Okay, there are different approaches to that. Static, dynamic, you can do substitution, sort of like only showing the last four of your social security number. You can have algorithms, you can shuffle or mask data or delete data. Once again, based upon the classification of the data, this drives how you can mask the data. Sometimes you can anonymize the data by removing all of direct identifiers. And then you, you may also have to look at indirect the identifiers of your data. Tokenization. With credit cards, tokenization is used to substitute sensitive data elements with non-sensitive equivalents. 
Tokenization is not encryption, but it can be used to protect your data. And all of this, on top of this, you have to prevent, ensure discovery and classification. You need to monitor. And if somebody breaks your laws, your rules, you have to enforce this. This is DLP and digital rights management, which is an extra layer of access control on top of your data or object. This is agnostic to the location of the data, and it's not limited to only documents. You can apply this to video, audio, or just about any type of data. And this is how you put a data protection baseline across all of your information. And if you're going into the cloud, each resource must be provisioned with an access policy. You have, must have established trust, local digital rights management agents on devices. You need to be able to have DRM aware software to make sure that it's compatible with your, with your applications and the devices that you may use. So laws and regulations are a big aspect of it. And over the past few years, starting back in the 70s, there have been a rapid increase in the global protection of data. The Convention for Protection of Individuals, European Telecommunications uh, Data Protection Laws, the European Parliament, and the General Data Protection Regulation. So, Data privacy laws exist in over 120 countries. And for the past few years, there's very significant progress. So GDPR enforcement last year is a major effect on your governance. And privacy and data protection addresses, is driven by all of these aspects of your data. So this gives you additional areas where you need to classify your data. This is based upon the law affecting your data and the industry regulations. Now, when you're thinking about this, when you're updating your data governance, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development provides privacy guidelines which says you have to limit the data you collect, make sure it's quality data. You have to specify how the data is being used, limit its use, and put safeguards in, in place. So all of this needs to be embedded in your data governance processes. And GDPR has increased the territorial scope this means that even if you're not in Europe, you can be prosecuted for violating the European GDPR laws. There are very stiff penalties and you have to have consent for using somebody's data. And there are enhanced data subject rights, one of which is that you cannot own the personal data of any European citizen. So understand the data subject, understand your requirements to the data protection authority, which exists in every country, your contractual requirements and the technical procedures or controls that you may need to put in place to protect your data. The other thing that's really important are the data management roles. When you create data, you need to understand the subject, who controls the data, the data controller makes decisions with respect to how the data is used. Typically, it's the organization itself. Data processor, typically it's the cloud service provider, the data stewards, data custodian, and who the actual data owners are, all right? All of these roles need to be defined in your governance. And for privacy and data protection compliance, the laws, the scope, how long you have to keep the data, your obligations should the data be breached, and the status of all your data. 
once again, needs to be put into your data governance. There are many contractual obligations. Uh, information is may not be permitted to be shared. This goes into the classification aspect. And the data controller retains responsibility for any data passed to a data processor. So when you use put data into the contain legal responsibility for protecting that data. So if the cloud data provider trans transfers that data across borders, that could be state borders or national borders, you are responsible. So you need to clarify the laws and monitor your data no matter where it is. And it may not be easy. There are multiple legal challenges and conflicts in the law. And there's really not a large body of lawyers that understand cloud data law. So the organization needs to have a very clear understanding of how the laws and regulations apply to them when they put their data into the cloud, because you are responsible for any actions of the cloud service provider. Now, the National Institute of Standards and Technology actually provided a list of what's considered personally identifiable information. And this, this is a great list, but depending upon your legal jurisdiction, you can have other things that are also personally identifiable information. For instance, a web cookie. The fact that you're using cookies, it can be a personal data that can't the jurisdictions, all right? And in the end, all you need to also know how you can retain the data, how to archive the data, and how to delete the data. And as we said before, your policies need to look at the data formats, what controls need to be put in place, who can actually pull data out of archival, and how to delete the data. Because data mapping, data classification, your procedures, and your ability to monitor this data will be driven by the law. How you encrypt the data, how you monitor it, how you back it up, all of this is part of your governance. In the end, the law will tell you how you can delete your data. And you, can, you can't physically destroy your data because you don't have it. You can't walk into a data center and degauss the disk. You really can't overwrite the data because you don't know where it is. So the only way is through crypto shredding and that's encrypting the data before it goes into the cloud. And then when you want to delete it, you throw away the key or you destroy the key. Now with that, that's sort of the end of this quick overview on how to protect your data in the cloud. And I'd be remiss by not inv inviting you to see some of my other courses, <laughs> which you can take a little longer to look at on Pluralsight. Uh, so with that, we're opening up to questions. What's, what's, it says, what skills should I look for in hiring with respect to data roles? So one of the school, the most important skill is someone that really actually understands cloud computing. And I'm not talking about understanding Amazon or understanding Azure. I'm talking about understanding general from a general point of view um, so they can understand the different types of storage, uh, the different, and they can compare and contrast the different aspects or services that are available from cloud service providers. Uh, don't, get, don't get fooled by thinking if you know a specific uh, cloud service providers capabilities that you know everything. Um, 
let's see, having um, so I'm, I'm not, oh, there it is. Okay, how common are fines and criminal punishments with respect to data? So they are actually getting uh, very common. The data protection officials in, in Europe uh, are lever have levied at least uh, five fines to Facebook. Uh, Google is uh, liable to billions of dollars in fines. And the state of California is lever levering fines on organizations that are not uh, protecting their data properly. Um, what, what cloud security certificates would you recommend in addition to the CCSP? So the um, security, uh, cloud security knowledge from the Cloud Security Alliance, CSA, is a very good starter for understanding the general aspects of protecting your information. They also have a course on the cloud control matrix, which will help you understand specific controls that you can put in place uh, for the cloud. Remember, though, that each cloud service provider has uh, different controls available. Um, so what is the best source to learn for cloud security? So I, I would say um, um, I may be biased, but the uh, ISC squared has some very good training uh, for cloud security that's specific to cloud. Um, so from a management point of view, I would uh, I would go in that direction. Um, and I guess there's one more question. Uh, what predictions do you have about how data protection laws are going to continue to be written and enforced? So I believe that data protection will accelerate uh, because information technology is a core economic a component of every country. And every country wants to protect its economic viability. And key to that is protecting data. So I think there will be more and more data protection laws with more and more enforcement. Um, and with that, I think I'm, I'm out of time. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation, Kevin, and, and tackling those questions. Um, you shared so much great material today, but I just wanted to give you the opportunity to maybe share one final thought or takeaway with everyone here. So, so in the end, cloud computing is a way of doing things. It's a new model for doing your business or mission. It's not about the technology. You won't be successful by just picking Amazon, picking Azure. You're successful by understanding your business model and aligning your data and how you use your data with the capabilities of cloud computing. And that means looking at your data governance and making sure you can apply that data governance to the cloud business model.